Welcome to Walking the Torah Portions. I'm Tyler Merwin, and this is Torah Portion, Vayachi. This week's Torah Portion begins in Genesis 47, 28, to the end of the book, which is 50, 26. This week's Half Torah is 1 Kings 2, 1 through 12. Vayachi is translated, and he lived. And Jacob lived in the land of Egypt 17 years, so the days of Jacob, the years of his life, were 147 years. This week's Torah portion is the last portion of the book of Genesis, or Bereshit. This portion is unique in all the Torah for an odd reason. In the Torah scroll, there is no punctuation, there's no chapter markers or verse numbers, there's not even capitalization. The only way to see the beginning of a portion is to look for breaks in the text. And the idea is if you had a Torah scroll and you open it up, you knew what the Torah portion like Vahi, you would actually look for a break in the text and wherever the breaks were, you would start to read the words. And when you came to the proper word, I'm Vahi, you know that that's where that Torah portion started. Now these breaks can be large breaks, similar to how we separate paragraphs, or they can be smaller. The general rule is that a new portion will begin on a new line or is separated from the previous portion by at least nine letter spacing. What makes this week's portion unique is that it has no extra spacing at all between it and Torah portion by Egash. Because of the missing spacing, the famous sage Rashi refers to this portion as quote unquote closed. I believe the spiritual aspect of it being closed or a closed portion refers directly to Jacob's prophetic blessings of the 12 tribes in this portion that is to come about where it says at the end of days. Although there is prophecy that we can clearly see in this section, there is still more that is sealed up or closed until the appointed time. Genesis 47, 29 through 31 says, and when the time drew near that Israel must die, he called his son Joseph and said to him, If now I have found favor in your sight, put your hand under my thigh and promise to deal kindly and truly with me. Do not bury me in Egypt, but let me lie with my fathers. Carry me out of Egypt and bury me in their burying place. He answered, I will do as you have said. And he said, Swear to me. And he swore to him. Then Israel bowed himself upon the head of his bed. Jacob, knowing his time was near, summoned Joseph to get things in order. The first order of business was to ensure that he will be buried with his wife Leah in the cave of Machpelah, where the other patriarchs and matriarchs were buried. As we discussed before, this is a sacred place, thought to be the entrance back to the Garden of Eden. Being buried there speaks to the faith of resurrection. Being buried on the literal doorsteps of heaven. Jacob believes that the burial request is so important to the covenant and the future of Israel that he has Joseph put his hand underneath Jacob's thigh, which refers to his reproductive organs. If you remember also, we saw this back when Abraham had his servant do the same thing to him when getting a wife for his son Isaac from his family. At some point after this, Jacob becomes ill and Joseph comes to him with his sons Manasseh and Ephraim. In Genesis 48, 3-6 we read, And Jacob said to Joseph, God Almighty appeared to me at Luz in the land of Canaan and blessed me, and said to me, Behold, I will make you fruitful and multiply you, and I will make you a company of peoples and will give you this land to your offspring after you for an everlasting possession. And now your two sons who were born to you in the land of Egypt before I came to you in Egypt are mine. Ephraim and Manasseh shall be mine, as Reuben and Simeon are. And the children that are you fathered after them shall be yours. They shall be called by the name of of their brothers in the inheritance. The blessing Jacob will place on Joseph's sons, Manasseh and Ephraim, 
will formally adopt them as his own sons, giving them direct, a direct portion in their inheritance. We read in verse 13, And Joseph took them both, Ephraim in his right hand, towards Israel's left hand, and Manasseh in his left hand, towards Israel's right hand, and brought them near him. The symbology throughout Scripture and in ancient times is that the right hand symbolizes preeminence and strength. The left hand doesn't refer to being weak by any means. It's just simply not as strong as the right. When referring to the Holy One, His right hand is also the hand of mercy, whereas His left hand is His strict justice. God is truly mercy and justice, but thankfully for our sakes, His mercy outweighs His strict justice. And where is Yeshua sitting right now? At the right hand of the Father, making intercession for us. Make sense? So we see that Manasseh lined up on Jacob's right and Ephraim on his left, the older one on the right, the younger one on the left. And it says in 48.14, And Israel stretched out his right hand and laid it on the head of Ephraim, who was the younger, and his left hand on the head of Manasseh, crossing his hands, for Manasseh was the firstborn. So Jacob crosses his hands, signifying that Ephraim would have preeminence over his older brother, Manasseh. After blessing the boys, Joseph tries to correct what he thinks to be a mistake by Jacob's crossed hands. But Jacob reassures Joseph that it is not a mistake. Ephraim will be greater than Manasseh. And we read in verse 20, So he blessed them that day, saying, By you Israel will pronounce blessing, saying, God make you as Ephraim and Manasseh. Thus he put Ephraim before Manasseh. And so it is to this day. It's customary on Arab Shabbat to bless your sons with, May the Lord make you like Ephraim and Manasseh. And for our daughters, we bless them with, May the Lord make you like Rachel and Leah, like Sarah and Rebekah. After adopting and blessing Joseph's sons, we pick up in chapter 49, verse 1. Then Jacob called for his sons and said, Assemble yourselves, and I will tell you what will befall you in the end of days. Here I'm using the English translation from Art Scroll. I will use this from time to time as it more accurately translate the li translates the literal Hebrew text. Most English translations, such as the ESV that I primarily use, can be too focused at times on ensuring that it makes sense to our English ears and to the English reader, but it can miss important nuances in the original Hebrew text. Here we see in the opening line that though the pronouncement Jacob makes regarding the tribes can be seen partially now, their whole meaning is reserved for the end of days. Of Reuben, it says, in verses 3 and 4, Reuben, you are my firstborn, my might, and the firstfruits of my strength, preeminent in dignity and preeminent in power. Unstable as water, you shall not have preeminence, because you went up to your father's bed, then you defiled it, he went up to my couch. Here we see why Reuben lost his position as leader of the tribes, which would have normally gone to the firstborn. Simeon and Levi are gathered, are grouped together. It says, Simeon and Levi are brothers. Weapons of violence are their swords. Let my soul not come into their counsel. O oh, my glory, be not joined to their company. For in their anger they killed men, and in their willfulness they hamstrung oxen. Cursed be their anger, for it is fierce, and their wrath, for it is cruel. I will divide them in Jacob and scatter them in Israel. Here we see why Simeon and Levi are also disqualified from the leadership position as we discussed in Torah portion by Ishlach. Jacob says that they will be divided and scattered like food on a Waffle House grill. 
We know that Levi will be assigned the priesthood and will not be given a portion of land, but will be scattered throughout the territories of Israel. Simeon, on the other hand, seems to just be diminished over time into the smallest of the tribes. There are 59,300 strong at the time of Mount Sinai, but are down to 22,200 by the time of Deuteronomy. Then we get to Judah. Read from verse 8 through 12. Judah, you, your brother, shall acknowledge. Your hand will be at your enemy's nape. Your father's sons will prostrate themselves to you. A lion's cub is Judah. From the prey, my son, you elevated yourself. He crouches, lies down like a lion, and like an awesome lion, who dares rouse him? The scepter shall not depart from Judah, nor a scholar from among his descendants, until Shiloh come, arrives, and his will be an assemblage of the nations. He will tie his donkey to the vine branch his, fo- his donkey's foal. He will launder his garments in wine and his robe in the blood of grapes, red-eyed from wine and white-toothed from milk. This again is another translation from the art scroll. So that Judah will have the leadership role. Judah will have the perpetual kingship, the Davidic dynasty, and also the line of the Messiah. Take note that the symbolism of the robe stained with wine, the blood of the grapes, and how this matches other Messianic texts like Isaiah 63 and Revelation 19. Then we get to Zebulun in verse 13. Zebulun shall dwell at the shore of the sea. He shall become a haven for ships, and his border shall be Sidon. Zebulun is mentioned ahead of Issachar, even though Issachar is older than Zebulun. In the future, Zebulun would support Issachar in trade in First Temple times. Of Issachar, in verse 14 and 15, it says, Issachar is a strong donkey, crouching between the sheepfolds. He saw that a resting place was good, and that the land was pleasant. He bowed his shoulder to bear, and became a servant of forced labor. Then of Dan we read, Dan shall be the judge of his people as one of the tribes of Israel. Dan shall be a serpent in the way and a viper by the path that bites the horse's heels so that his rider falls backward. I wait for your salvation, O Lord. Dan shall carry out judgment or avenge his people, as the art scroll puts it. In Revelation 7, When the 144,000 from the tribes are listed, Dan is not listed, but also Ephraim is not listed either. Dan was not erased because the text clearly states that every tribe was present. The tribal listing in different parts of scripture vary in their tribal makeup and their tribal order, trying to teach us something specific about the section we are reading. In verse 18 of our portion, seems to jump off topic and states, I wait for your Yeshua, or your salvation, yod heh vav I think one of the reasons that Dan is not being listed in Revelation 7 is that Yeshua had come at that time, and Dan's role of avenger is not needed. In verse 19, we read of Gad, Raiders shall raid Gad, but he shall raid at their heels. Of Asher in verse 20, we read, Asher's food shall be rich, and he shall yield royal delicacies. Naphtali, in verse 21, says, Naphtali is a doe, let loose, that bears beautiful fawns. Then we get to Yosef. A charming son is Joseph, a charming son to the eye. Each of the daughters climbed heights to gaze. They embittered him, and became antagonists. The arrow-tongued men hated him, but his bow was firmly in place, and his arms were gilded. From the hands of the mighty power of Jacob, from there he shepherded the stone of Israel. That is, 
from the God of your father, and he will help you, and with Shaddai, and he will bless you with blessings of heaven from above, blessings of the deep crouching below, blessings of the bosom and womb. The blessings of your father surpass the blessings of my parents and the endless bounds of the world's hills. Let them be upon Joseph's head and upon the head of the exile from his brothers. And that's verse 22 through 26. Again, another art scroll translation. English translations for this passage very widely, and that's why I gave you the art scroll. You can again see the blessing and preeminence of Joseph, similar to that of his brother Judah. Then we read of Benjamin in verse 27. Benjamin is a ravenous wolf, in the morning devouring the prey, and at evening dividing the spoil. The ordering of this list is first the children of Leah, then the oldest of Bilhah, which is Rachel's handmaiden, then Zilpah's two children, which were Leah's handmaiden, and then Bilhah's youngest, and lastly, Rachel's two sons. After addressing each tribe, he instructs all the sons to bury him in Hebron at the cave of Machpelah. In verse 33 we read, Then Jacob finished commanding his sons. He drew up his feet into the bed and breathed his last and was gathered to his people. The Hebrew text here insinuates that he dies, but it doesn't outright tell you that he actually died. So the sages interpret this generally to imply that the spirit of Israel will never die. They have Jacob embalmed, and Egypt mourns for him for 70 days. Joseph asked Pharaoh for permission to leave his duties in order, to, in order to fulfill the vow that he made to his father to bury him in Hebron, and Pharaoh grants his petition. A great throng of Israelites and Egyptians company, accompany the brothers as they travel to Hebron to bury Jacob in the cave of the couples. After this, the brothers fear Joseph might now retaliate against them for selling him to Egypt, now that dad is gone. But Joseph comforts them. The text says that he speaks to their heart, that this was God's plan, and it saved many lives. This portion ends with the death of Joseph, as we read in chapter 50, verse 24. And Joseph said to his brothers, I am about to die, but God will visit you and bring you up out of this land to the land that he swore to Abraham, to Isaac, and to Jacob. Then Joseph made the sons of Israel swear, saying, God will surely visit you, and you shall carry up my bones from here. So Joseph died, being 110 years old. They embalmed him, and he was put in a coffin in Egypt. Like Joseph and Jacob before him, even though we are in Egypt currently, or we're in Babylon, let's have our sights fixed on our inheritance, the promised land. If Yeshua tarries, and I die here in exile, carry my bones to Jerusalem. After we finish reading a book of the Torah, it's customary to proclaim, Kazakh, Kazakh, Venik, Kazakh, which means, be strong, be strong, and may we be strengthened. I pray this teaching has been edifying to you. Let's lift up the name of the Holy One with love in Echad. Shalom. Thank mm -hmm. you.